Welcome to the Green Ring, and thanks for watching. This video is second in a series of nine, presenting a note-by-note -note analysis of Wagner's Das Rheingold, Scene 4. Built on nearly two centuries of scholarly literature, its massive journey aspires to examine the whole of Der Ring des Nibelungen to its final note. I hope you'll take this voyage with me, one I'm dedicated to completing. For an explanation of who I am, and more on the reasons for this series, please check out my preface video. Its link is supplied below, along with those for the other videos preceding this one. We pick up where we left off in Dover's full score on the second stave of page 229, as, having relinquished the Tarnhelm as part of his ransom, Albrecht imagines he'll at least escape with his ring. A string quaver pizzicato finishing his aside, Albrecht calls to his jailers a cappella on a fifth descent. After the separating quaver rest, his next three static notes become a twisting air to chord note opposition, making its conclusion reverse melody notes, his racial hopes still alive. Quaver string pizzicato chords creep in under his last pulse as he demands his release on three ejaculations separated by semi-quaver rests, first leaping up a fourth, then a third to outline the heroic melody notes, but finished with a less hopeful chord note pulse and plunging fifth. Loge offhandedly asks Wotan's permission. His first phrase, a static triplet and fifth rising into chord notes, his second, a distortion of the dwarf's frustrated erotic turn, each bracketed in nonchalant chording on pizzicati string quavers. To heighten the suspense, a benign arco violin viola chord answers breve in smug major, and after a minim quaver rest for it added tension, Photon at last points to Albrecht's ring, his vocal a felt erb triad, between two melody note pulses, a phrase redolent of his newborn racial hopes, the last of which becomes chagrin, though through a terminal plunging fifth. This line also, therefore, includes a crib of Loge's duplicity. Showing he means business, Photon barks, Hörst du Alp to an ugly inverted ash interval on a dire falling octave. Signal this is a bad business indeed. He goes on a cappella, decreeing the ring part of the horde, to a spear rounded by the heroic defense module, Albrecht's shocked response, a pathetic rising sixth, punched by a fortissimo pizzicato across all strings. Cook presents the following argument's core ideas, a praises whose fluent economy is recommended to all readers. One of its insights is that Wotan and his foe are sides of the same power-tainted coin, whom in Siegfried Wotan names Light and Dark Albrecht, Licht Schwarz, echoing the dwarf scene three moniker for the gods as Licht Alben. The present confrontation between these, the work's hero and its villain over the tale's single most important physical item, ought to be rife in orchestral syntax. Yet at first blush, it feels sparse, the Meister's style not yet ready or able to shed its quasi-recitative. But Wagner means for this pivotal dispute to be especially well understood, and carefully restrains its symphonic devices, his orchestration initially in strings alone. Other choirs snuck in only gradually. You can always hope to rely on the words in house translations, but if you do, you had better pay pretty close attention to every word. However, important syntax does occur, whose frequency increases as the dispute intensifies. Photon counters the dwarf's horror by decreeing the ring as part of the ransom, bouncing from two static notes down a third into a rising fifth, an echo of his lust for its power. Continuing over a string minim pedal chord with chord notes that become melody notes to fall a sixth, he creates chagrin, syntactic modules no audience is likely to grasp on first hearing, even as they assert the horrific reversal embodied in the god's claim, Erda's part in it, and the future power to enforce it. Spurred with a sharp quaver chord, then supported by a softer minim, their double impact, a sly nod to the giant's previous outrage, Albrecht pleads his life rather than the ring, on chord notes, and after a semi-quaver rest and three static notes, a rising erda fourth. 
Wotan counters heftiger, supported by two similar chords in different harmonies, the last sustained as a semi brevi as he barks, Den Reif Velanisch, an upward echoing fourth in his voice, followed by the Welterb triad, backbone to a hideous inverted ash interval, which, after a quaver rest, continues with another descending third to make the phrase a ring fragment. He contemptuously leaves the dwarf his life to do with as he will, by leaping up a tritone into chord notes, rounded by a crib of Loge's earlier twit, itself a ringless strophe, its capper a plunging fifth. As it turns out, this is among the greatest errors in judgment the god ever makes. A falling spear on low marcato strings leads to Alberich reduced to begging, as he calls the ring literally a physical part of himself. Punctuating this appeal, two pairs of sforzando dotted minim string chords subtly repeat the double impact effect with their off-the-beat shifting inner harmonies, while also outlining reverse melody notes. The dwarf's first pleading phrase moves through static notes to end in a static ash interval and falling tritone. After a quaver rest, his next bounces on thirds into a similar group of static notes topped with another chord note opposition that itself creates reverse melody notes, subtle hints that module represents his physical being through his nibelung slaves, as already suggested by that morpheme's uses in scene 3. He goes on naming Hand und Haupt, Aug und Ohr, to a pair of reverse slash interval phrases, the second raised to tone over the first, and each on chord notes. It's a syntactic combination redolent of the conflict inherent in his plea, which the strings punctuate with two rising chords in the rests between his words. His next phrase expands this idea by lifting a third into a static ash interval capped by a plunging fifth, then finished by rising on melody notes into the distinctive module often repeated by both in this scene and the previous of Wotan scene to lust for the ring, intoned by Albrecht to the words Rota Ring. Wotan's impassioned rejoinder at last sweeps away the quasi-recitative to initiate a long symphonic sweep, its figurehead a remarkable syntactic moment. It begins as violins, violas, in tone of furious sextuplet tremolo pedal, while low strings outline the giant opposing turn from Loge seen to advice on how Wotan may defeat his Nibelung foe. This introduces the god as he sings a version of Alberich's defiant scene three threat to his slaves, Wotan's line imbuing the morpheme's ominous harshness with eloquence, even nobility, thanks to changing its wonted falling tritone into a heroically tragic descending fifth, while leaving its melody notes intact. This cell, in its various incarnations, plays a surreptitious but constant role in the Rheingold syntax, from the dwarf scene one wooing, through Fricka's scene two scolding, its idea gaining force in scene three, and always with a sense of hard, even seditious resistance, either subtle or brazenly obvious. Here the module is particularly apt, since Wotan's agenda throughout the epic is resistance to all claims on nature's power but his own, with Alberic's threat against his hegemony the greatest of them all. What gives this module especially intense poignancy here is its second violin-viola-tremolo harmonization, moving down reverse melody notes, another module redolent of the conflicting ideas of god and dwarf for world domination which, it should be noted, are both in opposition to Erda. The god's eloquence is brief, however, and he moves into invective against the dwarf bouncing down an inverted ash interval on a tritone, then back up that harsh interval as echoed in low strings to intone melody notes, capped by another heroic but tragic plunging fifth, to produce a chagrin pulse. The orchestral support is equally rich, cellos passing from the giant turn reversal through air to court notes into a hint of the giant's similar resistance, to fall an octave, then sketch a tritone in support of the immortal's vocal. 
as pointedly the orchestral texture is regularly interspersed with chord notes, hints that become explicit when Wotan's dismissive epithets are punctuated by two unmistakable pulses of the chords themselves, two abrasive pairs whose impacts recall the outrage of both Nibelungs and Giants, one born of Albrecht's anguish over his rejection by the Rhine Maidens. This seemingly chance detail is already a staple of the tetralogy syntax, here underlined as the contrabasses leap up a staccato octave, mark of the natural energy at stake here. What prior to Wotan's eloquence is quasi-recitative, with this rich syntactic bundle flowers into the briefest of ariettas for the god, who scolds the dwarf's presumption atop a uniquely subtle accompaniment, a pair of distinctive syntactic bundles. Over contrabasses sliding up minims in a chromatic octavo scale of extended melody notes, violas sound a double impact followed by staccato pulses, while at a dotted quaver parallax, cellos intone another double impact only to sync arco on chord notes. This amounts to a consecutive pair of double impacts echoing those in his prior vocal, and the chord notes capping them to repeatedly evoke that outrage first crystallized by the giants. Raised to second in the next measure, the whole bundle repeats with viola's cellos exchanging their parts. This brief crescendo builds as contrabasses freeze on a minim semi brevi pedal enriched by two horns creeping into the mix while the viola cello pulses rise in reverse chord notes, the whole capped by a strident reprise of the double chord impact, its contrabasses this time reversing themselves by plunging an octave. Atop the first of these echoing bundles, Wotan's vocal begins by plunging a fifth in a cruel inverted ash interval, only to contradict it by leaping up a sixth on a high, his cause both execrable and noble. He then falls another accusative fifth to double the string pulses on extended melody notes, all as he stresses the gold's questionable ownership. The god presses his line of attack atop the second bundle, with a vocal so uniquely instructive its examination must await Albrecht's responsive echo in a few measures. What can be said is the orchestration augments this second complex with a solo horn discanting his vocal on minims, two plunging fifths followed by extended melody notes in echo of the contrabasses, while tremolo violin viola pulses intensify the texture. As these increase to sextuplets, low strings outline an up-down turn recalling Loge's advice, the dragon, and its echo launching the arietta. It introduces horns joined by bassoons, sighing two consecutive air accord pulses in their Rhine Maiden context, followed by a third, its harmony soured as in Loge's panegyric revelation, the entire bundle annoyed at first by monotone staccato cello quavers, soon joined by viola's violins. Together, these drive the god, demanding of his adversary whether the nymphs agreed to his robbery of their gold. It should be noted the Meister freezes a last potential chord strophe on its first note, violins contrabasses trading their monotones for two syncopations, violas sawing at an octuplet tremolo crescendo. This moves focus away from the chord notes before they might otherwise develop into their most threatening form, meaning when Alberich menaces his slaves with the ring itself, a subliminal confirmation that Wotan ignores the horror of that perversion of nature's power to justify its seizure for himself. Above this complex, his vocal lifts a third into a Welter triad shaped by an inverted ash interval, another hint the god solidifies his plans for countering the Nibelung's racial threat. Wotan then falls a third to rise a fourth, yet another distorted ringlust echo, to descend on the fourth into an ominous ghost of the dwarf's own defiance, which expands by ascending on melody notes, then drops a third into chord notes. He finishes, lifting on a second set of melody notes and falling a third into a low ash interval on heroic rising fifth, itself another outline of his ring lust, the entire bouquet charged with natural power at its most ambivalent. 
Staring loss of the ring in the face, as Albrecht now does, he passionately objects with his own and longer arietta, which begins with a crucial new syntactic evolution. It launches on Wotan's last vocal, hankering after the ring's power, through a low ash interval. Simultaneously, violas rise a three-octave span, recalling the dwarf scene three intimidations, joined at the top note by a woodwind horn crotchet chord. This launches a tremolo pedal in remaining strings, from which violas tumble down an arpeggio resembling an extended ring fragment, one terminated by chord notes. The dwarf's vocal, a Welterb triad, leaves no doubt the viola module is a child of the fragment, particularly since his first held pitch gives it stage, after which he echoes the viola's chord notes at an arresting parallax, doubled by the cello tremolo. Massed horns punch a high ash interval in tortured diminished minor seventh chords as violas rise in an inversion of the fragment, only to repeat the fragment chord note pairing while Albrecht sings a complete fragment pulse, his first held pitch again giving the viola arpeggio stage, all of it to excoriate the god's blatant duplicity. While the rising viola octaves might represent Wotan's just cause, they're more likely an echo of the dwarf's scene three gauntlet, here turned to outrage. Meanwhile, the horn's ash interval implies Alberich's even more righteous claims against the god. The dwarf scene one cries of woe are first in the epic to pointedly highlight the chord notes, and in this passage, as twice reinforced by the cello violin tremolo, they're imbued with an elemental sexual force twisted by loveless determination. Moreover, the viola line traces that falling, rising, falling sign which, passed from facile shock through Loge explaining the ring's magic, is coming to suggest forces ranged against the immortal. This idea grows still more potent thanks to the repeated fragment overlays, with their growing sense of an altered Nibelung race. On the brink of losing control of his dwarves, Alberich bristles as if with a foretaste of their potentially uncontrolled expansion. Wotan inevitably acquires the ring's power by seizing it from the dwarf, but in doing so unleashes on the world what the Nibelungs have become thanks to their grim contact with that fearful talisman. Still vigorous and sexually potent, they can only burgeon into a genuine racial threat hitherto unthinkable until this moment. Albrecht's immediately following vocal explores the underlying power driving that racial menace, the force at the root of all the arguments which underpin this first episode of Scene 4. It drives the three characters presently in conflict to throw its weight across the entire tetralogy until, in the work's final chapter, its last deadly flower blossoms with devastating effect. The dwarf's latest vocal moves through an unusually large number of up-down leaps, consisting of two halves. Its initial phrase leads to its coda, both launched on closely similar rising-falling modules, their initial pulses high ash intervals, the second of them capped by a low interval. Wotan's previous argument is sung over that unique orchestral combination of double impacts and chord notes, while Loge's echoing tease begins scene four. Each of these lines are constructed so like Alberich's that, while they're not identical, are close enough they might be refrains from the same aria. What most distinguishes these three from one another are their strikingly different codas, each of which sharply identifies the character who sings them. The dwarf launches on a rising air to fourth, then mimics his phrase's initial portion to finish by exchanging its high ash interval for its reversal, a richly ambivalent mix suggesting both his own culpability and that of the god he accuses. Wotan's coda repeats an expansion of the dwarf's defiance, which the god has only just developed, all part of Wotan's growing realization of the obstacles he faces, thanks to the seemingly insoluble poser of the ring's legitimate owner. Loge's coda reproduces his own chord note module, and is the only one of the three to include tritones. What binds the three lines are their profusion of intervallic leaps, both up and down. Seconds, fourths, tritones, fifths, sixths, 
and sevenths. This focus on melodic intervals no doubt seems like nitpicking, but it isn't in the least, since how these are parsed among the three characters involved is as revealing as their vocals' overall shapes. It seems only right that Loge's vocal alone contains falling seconds, meaning air to chord notes, yet the fourth, with its potent air to associations, is found only in its rising form, and only in Albrecht's vocal, sign of his complaint's justice. The fifth, pivotal to the epic syntax, invariably connotes heroic strength when it ascends, and doom on its descent, and is the most frequently heard across the three vocals, eight pulses in all, its positive connotations evenly balanced with its negative. The surprise is that all but one of the rising fifths are found in the dwarf's line, the only other in Wotan's, while none of the four baleful downward fifths occur in Alberich's line, two of them sung by Wotan, two by Loge. In contrast, in equally revealing the poignant sixth, but for a single one falling in Wotan's line, only rises, six pulses in all, and only once in the Nibelung's vocal to cap his line, the rest not surprisingly parsed equally between Wotan and Loge. Especially noteworthy, the three sevenths only fall, with their hints at revelations from Verda's mother womb, and only in Alberich's vocal. Put simply, these three disparate yet allied lines wrestle the power issues of this conflict over world rule, each modeled according to the character and virtue of the one singing it. Loge begins off-handedly with some poignance but little courage. Wotan continues, heroic bravado soiled by the crime he justifies and most heroic of the three, Alberic finishes with the passion of natural insight. All begin with distinctively similar up-down leaping modules fraught with world ash intervals, each line finished with their own distinguishing codas. Consider as well that, while strings alone support Loge's vocal, a lone horn augments both god and dwarf, their obligatos contradicting Wotan's vocal while reinforcing the dwarf with close canonic echoes, which reproduce his first world ash interval and complete his second. Equally intriguing, those same violas which sound the orchestral melody line in Albrecht's Outrage maintain their arco in his argument by doubling all three of the dwarves' downward sevenths. There seems no reason to doubt the Meister's intent is to indelibly link these passages in an audience's subconscious while progressively increasing the syntactic links between all three of the characters involved. But this is only Alberich's opening salvo in his last-ditch effort to rescue his plans for world domination. Furious Viola's Caput, with that distinctive ring fragment chord note module which initiates the dwarf's defense, to mark the broader racial peril which Wotan's theft must inevitably unleash. Beneath this, English horn, clarinet, and two horns intone the defiant cell, horns moving on from it into a ring fragment pulse which bassoons echo with the second fragment strophe as the dwarf expands on his censure of the god, each iteration doubled by Alberich's vocal with a pair of Welterb triads finished in reverse ash intervals while it leaded through a low. He continues by doubling a pair of natural signs, in effect rising then falling, whose rising lines move through abandonment triads, the first of them a reverse ring fragment, in effect a pair of abandonment triads, which module is about to have a massive impact on the overall syntax with both the scents followed by sexually charged reverse air to melody notes. Cello's violas alone double the first to be augmented in the second by bassoons whose melody notes descend in a hint of resignation. This juxtaposition of the extended ring fragment with what are effectively a pair of inverted ring pulses subtly echoes in telescoped form the unnatural falling rising sign corrected into a natural rising falling one, which defines Fasolt's righteous indignation in scene two, then percolates through the giant's desire to rob the gods of their immortality, introduces Loge's panegyric, hints at the emergent change in the Nibelungs, to finally suggest just the magic by which Alberich forges the ring and the dangers of wresting it from him.
To portray the dwarf's building anguish, a tremolo swelling across most of the strings banishes all but that choir for the next episode, as it sinks in the ghost of air chords. This goads him to leap up a third whose minim arco cording supports his next phrase. He sinks on a complete fragment, then lifts a fifth to descend on chord notes, the harmony ironically sweetened with the words, Wie glückt es nun, der Gleisner zum Heil? From this, he sinks a third and lifts a sixth, which he tops with a plunging octave on Niblung to rise on a still more pathetic sixth, thus intoning a wild pair of distorted ringla strophes. He's echoed in a complex viola cello counterpoint as he falls in air to fourth to sink from it on court notes. This launches his agonized portrait of his torment in making the ring, punctuated with regular six tuplet cello viola tremolo pulses off the beat. He intones a consecutive pair of abandonment triads to the words "Aus mehrlicher Not in der Zornes Wang." It's an echo, both of Fassold's appreciation of Albrecht's evil, and, when Fafner steps forward to propose abandoning Freya, a paradox of forsaken principles which dominates Valkyr. One the dwarf caps here with an exact ringla strophe to sink on chord notes. Disturbing offbeat tremolos, each separated by a crotchet rest, build harmonic intensity, while contrabasses in tone reverse melody notes, in minims, and the dwarf references the dread magic he's used by rising on spear-opposing extended melody notes. Violas again surge up three consecutive octaves, as he rises a third to sustain the term Verk over its ring fragment pulse, ratification of the Nibelung racial threat here launched by a woodwind arid accord strophe, underpinned by string tremolo. On the chord notes, he falls a tritone to rise on it into his original outcry against the Rhinebaden's cruelty, core of Freya's love syntax, nub of this conflict, his only thought being that such ghastly labor should benefit not him, but Votan instead. This leads to what is perhaps the dwarf's most personal and heart-rending plea, one which also contains major syntactic clues. Its orchestration consists of no more than viola, cello, and contrabass tremolos, as Albrecht describes the intense mental anguish he endured in creating the ring. In doing so, he lifts on reverse chord notes into a plaintive rising chain of three reverse melody note strophes in their evolving syntactic form. This, the most recognizable echo yet of that racial change taking place in all his nibelungs, violas take pains to make clear by doubling his vocal in crotchet bundles, meaning without those reverse world ash intervals, in each of his vocal notes. Another syntactic aspect of this reverse melody note chain is that, while in Nibelheim its consecutive strophes descend, here they ascend. What's more, their overlap also amounts to another group of three consecutive syntactic modules, namely Flosshilda's heroic cry with its courageous sense of the rescue, Albrecht desperately hopes his argument will bring him, reinforced by the string doubling. As he intones chord notes to initiate a low ash interval, he caps his phrase by outlining a pulse of fate, tremolo strings again doubling it to clarify its identity. This potent syntactic verbal alliance removes all doubt the fallen tyrant still hopes to dominate the world racially, and in revealing this to his opponent, he makes as bad a mistake as Votan does in allowing him to live. Immediately following, still striding string tremolos, as their density increases, he lifts on the melody notes proper, then falls a third to sketch two poignant unnatural signs. Both their falling halves terminate with suggestions of something between the Freya morpheme and the threat her loss poses the gods, while the first rises into its Freya aging memory on an abandonment triad. Albrecht concludes his phrase with the heroic cell, his words first mentioning his curse, if obliquely, as they evoke his original ban on love in order to acquire the gold, something Votan now means to benefit from without himself having made the awful sacrifice that justifies it. 
As Cook explains, since the god is the more culpable of the two, Albrecht has the moral advantage here, one amply confirmed by his impassioned Arietta. No audience grasps its dense syntax on first hearing, which they're only meant to assimilate gradually as the work unfolds. They need digest only the dwarf's righteous agony just before Wotan neatly sidesteps it by robbing him of his treasure without paying its cost. The dire shift in the world's makeup the god unleashes by his crime, as embodied both ethically and racially in the reverse melody note module, here underlined by Albrecht's plea, develops through the epic subsequent chapters to gradually reveal its full import. Of all these syntactic mysteries, the parallax between Flosshilde's heroics and Albrecht's defiance may seem the most cryptic. The key is that both initiate their process of solidification in Albrecht's scene three vocals. It's the dwarf's example which inspires the immortal to hit on his own solution to the Nibelung's threats, but the reverse is true of Albrecht. Put in the simplest terms, the dwarf's module signifies to both what opposes them, Flosshilde's module, their defenses against such threats. Albrecht's final plea ties all these ideas together, but not before his last warning. A dotted minim tremolo string chord punches fluch, as under him low string chord notes end with a tritone plunge to spark a portentous timpani roll. Horns low woodwinds ride it, sinking in an equally ominous ring fragment, elongated by woodwinds in echo of previous evolutions. The dwarf joins vocally after its first measure, warning the god with an inverted ash interval, then, after a crotchet rest, asserts his crime has been against himself alone, whose Velterb triad confirms this is hyperbole, never mind contradicted by what an audience sees of the damaged Rhine Maidens and Nibelungs. Begun in this way, both vocal and woodwinds continue by wandering over a disjointed reprise of the ring, rising on an abandonment triad which fades to lead the dwarf singing atop no more than the timpani roll. His initial module falls a third to rise a fourth, thus distorting ring lust. From this, after a crotchet rest parsing out the crime he's committed only against himself, he ascends a third into melody notes, capped with a downward third and rising heroic fifth. So precise a memory of Wotan's hunger for the ring immediately following its distortion triggers Albrecht's supreme indictment. The poetic text, with its foretaste of Erdos, Allem was war ist und wird, unmistakably identifies Wotan's crime as ultimately against the Earth Mother herself, which the syntax confirms. Massed strings and semiquaver sextuplets launch the passage by racing up loge chromatics, evoking Flosshilde's scene one recognition of Albrecht's potential threat. Here the morphine plays double duty, warning Wotan, but also warning of Wotan. Tremolo violas cellos outline five chromatically syncing chords, an echo from the scene three four interlude of embryonic fate and magic sleep. Taken together, it also foreshadows Erda Twilight, as well as confirming Loge's crucial role in that prophecy. On the accompaniment's top stave over the tremolo chords, first violins trade with seconds for complete repetitions, the same morphine that sews together the initial portion of Albrecht's peroration now acting as its pre-coda, while the last ring fragment chord note figure turns back on itself to mimic the ring. Albrecht's vocal has its own syntactic contributions, beginning with a bounce on thirds, a touch which has frequently imbued vocal lines with vitality, this being the most notable recent case, a touch that doesn't hit home syntactically until nearly this first chapter's end. With a rising air to fourth to produce yet another ringless distortion, the dwarf continues on two strophes of reverse melody notes, picking up on their recent appearance in his voice to evoke the revelations Wotan witnesses in Nibelheim, both intoning its chord notes on reverse ash intervals. 
He caps the last with his direct indictment of the god to Flosshilda's defiant cell, a morpheme which by now obviously impinges in a critical way upon the drama to come. As a last observation, his initial phrase includes another distortion of Wotan's ring lust. Another pair of ring fragment chord note arpeggios roar through strings opposed by and interwoven with their echoing upward arpeggios, all of it sustained by a horn woodwind semi brevi. The orchestra falls silent on a staccato quaver for the dwarf's final a cappella outburst, a crib on the ring which falls a velterb triad through a baleful inverted ash interval to rise on extended melody notes. The wordless coda, two more raging fragment chord note pulses, horns woodwind storming up a spear opposing scale, truncates Albrecht's scene three aspirations while its chromatics hint at Loge's sympathy. Alberich spells out the moral degeneracy of Wotan's projected deed, cementing their duality with the operative word frevel, thus echoing scene three when Wotan defames the dwarf as a frevlender gauch. The dwarf then adds that eerie foreshadowing of Erda's words who comes on the scene to personally repeat them shortly after Wotan commits the actual blasphemy in question. Albrecht's insight feels like that dream state from which Erda herself soon rises to the surface, his inspiration underpinned by a subtle evocation of Erda Twilight. Wotan's moral life stands at a critical juncture, for laying hands on the ring means setting himself on an irrevocable path. Until this moment, his actions, while often high-handed and callous, aim towards the good, at least in his own mind, and might even justify his rape of the world ash. We all of us have to wrest our inner strength away from the mother image, since that is where it lies as in a matrix. We have to fight and defy her for it. His world ash spear has given him apparent domination over the world, and thus the ability to establish order in it, without which there can only be chaos or blind and grim necessity, devoid of meaning and value. He has sought the power to achieve and safeguard it out of an appreciation of the shallow mindlessness of innocent play, however graceful, and the savagery of disorder. Stealing Albrecht's ring, however, involves the shattering of a moral absolute. Albrecht immediately senses Wotan's failure and cries out against the wrong done, not simply to himself as an individual, but to a world that is ordered on the sacred character of contractual exchanges. Albrecht is not angry at Wotan simply because Wotan stole Albrecht's ring. He is angry because Wotan has stolen the ring, thinking that he, Wotan, can avail himself of the ring's power without having to fulfill the required contractual exchange, in this case renouncing one desired end for another desired end, in effect, love for power. Shaw puts it rather more bluntly. That evil should, in its loveless desperation, create malign powers which Godhead could not create, seems but natural justice to Alberic. But that Godhead should steal those malign powers from evil and wield them itself is a monstrous perversion. While its true Loge at Erda's behest has maneuvered the god to this point, the very essence of their scheme is to put Wotan to the test, exactly as they've done with Albrecht and the Rheingold. The ultimate moral decision, as it has always been, is the criminals in question and theirs alone. That's the point. Wotan may choose the high road at any time, thus avoid his ethical doom, if not his physical. But it's no use. The dwarf's eloquence falls on deaf ears. Loge has made the god immovably committed to having the ring, even before their trip to Nebelheim. Wotan cries, Herr den Ring! to an ominous plunging octave in heroic rising fifth, yet another distorted version of the immortal's ring lust. It sparks a marcato iteration of the spear proper on octavo low strings, a sideways but undoubted reference to his world ash crime. After all, just as God and Dwarf oppose two radical personality types, Spear and Ring mirror nature's energy illegitimately purloined, each in different ways yet to the same end. 
Votan denies the Nibelung's right with a reverse ash interval on a pathetic sixth, only to surge up another heroic fifth, yet another ringless distortion, then marches through static notes to conclude on a horrific plunging tritone. Low octavo strings growl Flosshilda's heroic cell distorted by rising a diminished ninth, from which they coil through a dramatic plunging octave followed by chord notes, Alberic's capture as it flanks the scene 3-4 interlude. Spurred by Erda's prescient downward seventh, they march up a spear inversion, its motion twice interrupted by Loge chromatics, to crest on a single held note capped with a furious woodwind iteration of the Rheingold tattoo. Notably, it lacks its initial low ash interval, exactly as it sounds moments before Alberich tears the Rheingold from its bed, a subtle hint of these two deeds' identical perfidy. This ends on an orchestral cymbal crash as Wotan tears the ring mit heftiger Gewalt from Alberich's finger, who releases a grässlich howl. Others note the spear inversion prefacing this divine robbery, though none are aware of their precursors in scene three, those rising scales of Nibelung hope. The sequence is obviously a crucial dramatic moment, though most directors settle for Wotan merely pulling the ring from Albrecht's finger. Select productions, it's true, attempt to give the theft something of the syntax's teeth. Chereau's Wotan strikes the ring from Albrecht's finger with his weapon, a touch honored in Kupfer's 1992 production, if demurely hidden from view by the protagonist's dramatically posed bodies, which Kupfer reprises in 2005 for Lisieux, while Valencia's 2007 staging is a surprisingly tidy variant on this business. But in 2006, Copenhagen's Wotan saws off Albrecht's entire forearm in full view, blood squirting. The Welsh National Opera's 2009 condensed animation has the god chop off the dwarf's hand, without any real gore. An example Argentina's 2012 production follows. This may seem a minor point, but it's hardly that. While these various approaches are all interesting, they tend to be staged with a deaf ear to the music itself. The way in which Alberich loses his ring impinges on everything to follow, and to date no production has ever handled it in a way